It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, my colleague and friend, Professor Rex Richardson. Rex is simply one of the most sought after trumpet soloists and teachers in the world, working equally in both classical and jazz styles. Now, there are many soloists out there that play both styles and yet are clearly more at home in one or the other, or who sort of skim the surface of each, playing the standard repertoire, but not being deeply rooted in the tradition, nor contributing anything new to the music. Professor Richardson is unique in this regard, and that he plays the full spectrum of each genre, from traditional to the contemporary, and he has contributed to the furthering of the trumpet solo repertoire as a composer of jazz and classical pieces, and as a commissioner of many new works. Dr. Richardson has performed as a soloist with orchestras, brass bands, and wind ensembles around the world, literally dozens of concerts every year, each year, as well as jazz legends such as Ray Charles, Joe Henderson, Kurt Elling, and Dave Holland. Rex is a longtime member of the genre-defying classical chamber ensemble, well, classical and jazz, and genre-defying ensemble rhythm and brass, and leads his own jazz groups. Professor Richardson has degrees in anthropology and music from Northwestern and Louisiana State Universities, and has taught at VCU since 2002. He served as international tutor and trumpet at the Royal Northern College of Music in Manchester and at JAM Music Lab at University in Vienna. In 2009, he was presented with the VCU Arts highest honor, the Award of Excellence. In 2016, Dr. Richardson received a VCU Presidential Research Quest Fund grant to a commission and then premiere on multiple continents, of course, and record four new trumpet concertos, each by a different composer, all within a single year. This Herculean achievement was documented on a Freedom of Movement 21st Century Trumpet Concertos, which was released on Summit Records. Professor Richardson's newest commission to work is a full-length trumpet concerto by VCU Arts alumnus Troy Pollard, which will be premiered here in Richmond with the Richmond Symphony Orchestra this coming April. I have the pleasure of having known Rex for 20 years, beginning as an undergraduate student member of the search committee for his position. And in that time, I've played many gigs alongside him, from the somewhat glamorous to the very much not glamorous. I've also had the privilege of working with him on the faculty uh, as a colleague for the past 15 years. I know that as vast as his practical musical skills are, he's also a deep and critical thinker, and I'm excited for all of us tonight to gain some knowledge and insight from our esteemed colleague. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Rex Richardson. Hi, everybody. I'm so pleased to be here. Thank you, man. It was an amazing introduction. I'm, uh, I'm worried about really disappointing people after all the nice things you said about me, but uh, thank you very much. And um, yes, I'm so excited to have the opportunity to speak with all of you about um, something I find very interesting. And the name of the topic is Lessons from Jazz, as you can see, what improvisation can teach us about learning, mastery, and innovation. In recent years, a science of expertise has blossomed, bolstered by the popular works of authors such as Malcolm Gladwell, Daniel Coyle, and psychologist Kay Anders Erickson. These researchers probe the learning and teaching processes of a broad variety of experts, excuse me, experts ranging from the Florentine painters of the Renaissance to Brazilian soccer players and German concert violinists. However, none of them turn their gaze to what is arguably America's greatest art form, jazz, and the highly sophisticated art of improv improvisation that undergirds its performance practice. To many non-musicians, and indeed even to musicians who are not improvisers, it may appear that great jazz players are blessed by some gift or extemporaneous creation that is something that cannot be practiced. As a longtime jazz performer, I'd like to demonstrate that this is a profound misconception, and to at least begin to elucidate the complicated, years-long process of gaining mastery in a highly structured improvisational medium. I believe there are profound insights that jazz improvisation can lend to our broader understanding of the processes of learning, achieving mastery, and becoming an innovator. Applying the heuristic framework assembled by the aforementioned authors, my goal today is not so much to provide definitive answers, but to raise questions that explored more deeply than a 40 minute lecture will allow 
could provide valuable insights into our work as artists and teachers. Let's begin with a couple, a couple of conventional definitions of improvisation. So for Miriam Webster, we have the act or art of speaking or performing without practicing or preparing ahead of time. And dictionary.com gives us the art or act of composing, uttering, executing, arranging anything without previous preparation. So it seems that these definitions don't do justice to jazz improvisation, at least as it's done at a high artistic level. This is because, as I hope to show you, mastering this art requires thousands of hours of practice or what you might call previous preparation over a number of years. This assertion gives us a nice segue into the work of Malcolm Gladwell. Many of us have heard of the 10,000 hours of practice rule. This was popularized by Gladwell. In his book, Outliers, there's a chapter entitled The 10,000 Hours Rule. Gladwell cites a study by Kay Andrews Erickson at the Linz Academy of Music, in which Erickson studied violin students that had been placed in three groups identified by the professors as, in the first group, the best players, potential stars, in the second, the merely good, as Gladwell puts it, and in the third group, students who were unlikely to play professionally, but who instead intended to become music teachers in the German public school system. Through his interviews, asking how long each student spent practicing every week at age nine, 12, 14, and 20. He determined that the first group of players had, by age 20, each totaled 10,000 hours of practice. The second group of players had totaled 8,000 hours, and the third group, just over 4,000 hours. Interestingly, interestingly, Erickson found no exceptions, that is no, quote, naturals, who had practiced less but risen to the top, or on the other hand, as Gladwell calls them, grinds, who work harder than everyone but couldn't break into the top ranks. And by the way, these results were duplicate, duplicated in a similar study with pianists. The conclusion was that at the top ranks, nothing we'd consider natural talent, talent seemed to have any role. As Gladwell wrote, the people at the top just don't just work harder or even much harder than everyone else. They work much, much harder. As a brief aside here, Erickson's work has presented powerful evidence that besides some physical activities that might favor a certain body size or strength, natural talent doesn't even seem to exist. Most remarkably for musicians, he's shown that those who have perfect pitch, that is the ability to instantly sing or identify any particular note by name, which is only generally found in about one in 10,000 individuals, is not a quote, gift that they're born with. Studies have shown that virtually any person who undertakes a particular type, intensity, and length of musical training between the ages of three and five is almost guaranteed to develop perfect pitch, and that this might be the only way to attain it. So back to the 10,000 hour rule. Is the rule accurate? And furthermore, does it apply to jazz improvisation? Other experts, including the renowned neurologist and author Daniel Levitin, have also settled on what they believe is indeed the magic number as Gladwell puts it, for true expertise, 10,000 hours. And furthermore, it takes about 10 years to get 10,000 hours of practice in. Gladwell tries to apply this rule to the Beatles, who, as he points out, produced arguably their greatest achievements, Stars and Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band and the White Album, 10 years after the founding. He points out that back in 1960, when they were still unknown to most of the world, they started playing in Hamburg, Germany. They made multiple trips. And the gigs were hardcore, they, they were brutal. They would play for eight hours a night, seven nights a week. By the time they had their first big successes in 1964, they had performed live about 1,200 times, which, as Gladwell points out, is more than most bands perform in their entire careers. Does the rule apply to them as well? Gladwell certainly views it as a major reason for their musical and commercial success. So what did Anders, Anders Ericsson make of these assertions. Well, in his book, Peak, Secrets from the New Science of Expertise, he has a section entitled, no, <laughs> the 10,000 hour rule isn't really a rule. And he elaborates on this. He mentions Gladwell's citation of his work in Outliers. And he writes, 
There's nothing special or magical about 10,000 hours. But the rule is irresistibly appealing. It's easy to remember, for one thing. It would have been far less effective if those top violinists had put in, say, 11,000 hours of practice by the time they were 20. And it satisfies a human desire to discover a simple cause and effect relationship. Just put in 10,000 hours of practice in anything, and you will become a master. He goes on to point out that the biggest problem with this rule is that many people have interpreted it as a promise that almost anyone can become an expert in any given field by putting in 10,000 hours of practice. But nothing in this study implied this. All it showed was that the best violinists practice many more hours than the good violinists who practice many more hours than the music education students. On the other hand, the assumption that many years and thousands and thousands of hours are required to become one of the best in the world in a competitive field is correct. But the figure of 10,000 hours is not some magical barrier. He writes, the reason that you must put in 10,000 or more hours of practice to become one of the world's best violinists or chess players or golfers or perhaps jazz improvisers is that the people you'll be compared to have themselves put in 10,000 hours or more practice. Perhaps the most interesting point he makes is that Gladwell didn't distinguish between what he calls the, quote, deliberate practice, unquote, that the musicians in the study did and any sort of activity that might be labeled practice. With regard to the Beatles, he makes another important point. Performing isn't the same thing as practice, he writes. Yes, the Beatles almost certainly improved during their grueling years in Hamburg, but an hour of playing in front of a crowd where the focus is delivering the best possible performance at the time is not the same as an hour of focused, goal-driven practice that is designed to address certain weaknesses and make certain improvements, the sort of practice that was the key factor in explaining the abilities of the Berlin violin students. So what are we to make of deliberate practice and can it be applied in the study of jazz improvisation? And if so, how? It helps to distinguish deliberate practice from two other types of practice Erickson describes, naive practice and purposeful practice. Naive practice is essentially just doing something repeatedly, <clears throat> doing something repeatedly and expecting to make improvements. And it turns out it, it doesn't work very well. He gives a really interesting example. He gives several examples of this, but the most interesting is probably Ben Franklin, uh, Benjamin Franklin, who was known as one of uh, you know, America's most brilliant men in the early days of our history, who played thousands of hours chess, but surprisingly was by all reports mediocre. He played a lot of chess, but he didn't really practice. Now, purposeful, purposeful practice sounds pretty good. It has well-defined specific goals. It is focused. It involves feedback, that is knowing whether what you've done is right or wrong. It requires getting out of one's comfort zone. It is generally possible to improve to a certain degree with this approach to practicing. And it's generally what most fairly serious students do with a musical instrument, a sport, et cetera. But it's not enough to attain true mastery. This brings us to deliberate practice. So there's a lot to read here, but I'll, I'll take you through it. While it shares some elements with purposeful practice, they differ in some subtle but very important ways. Erickson writes, deliberate practice is informed and guided by the best performer's accomplishments and by an understanding of what these expert performers do to excel. This kind of practicing develops skills that other people have already figured out how to do and for which effective training techniques have been established takes place outside one's comfort zone, involves well-defined specific goals, requires a person's full attention and focus, full attention and conscious actions, involves feedback and modification of efforts in response to that feedback, produces and depends on effective mental representations, nearly always involves building or modifying previously acquired skills by focusing on particular aspects of those skills and working to improve them specifically step-by-step -step improvement that leads to expert performance. New skills are built on top of existing skills, which is why good fundamentals are so important. Now, in his book, The Talent Code, Daniel Coyle's exploration of what he calls deep practice overlaps with Erickson's findings in significant ways. He writes that deep practice is built on paradox, struggling in certain targeted ways, operating at the edge of your ability where you make mistakes 
makes you smarter. Of course, the term paradox alludes to the fact that we tend to judge mistakes as things to avoid, not to aim for. His three rules of deep practice are, number one, chunk it up. And this seems to be in separate sections. First, absorb the whole thing. This refers to getting a sense of the larger goal and perhaps giving yourself time to really live with a, a sculpture or a painting. For musicians, it means prolonged exposure to expert performers on our instrument and other instruments as well. Get the big picture, the larger concept. Next, break it into smaller chunks of focused practice. And the third part of this, the third sub part of this uh, rule is slow it down. Number two, repeat it. As opposed to Erickson's naive practice, this involves careful, details focused repetition. This ties in with another important theme of Coyle's book. He describes what happens in our brain when we develop skill. Recent findings show that white matter, a substance called myelin, is produced by specialized cells called oligodendrocytes and wraps around our neurons when we repeat an action with deliberate intention. The more myelin wrapping acquired, the better electrical insulation for that neural connection, and thus the faster signals are transmitted. This tra translates to deeper skill and faster execution. And indeed, this seems to be a, a real key ingredient of attaining mastery. This in play explains the importance of prolonged under tempo work in the performing arts. Number three, learn to feel it. This refers to the idea of, quote, finding the sweet spot. I interpret it as a musician as learning to drive my instrument, so to speak, by musical concept rather than by technical knowledge. I need to know what it's supposed to sound like with very clear mental representations, which of course ties in with Erickson's ideas. So how does all of this tie into an improvisational art form like jazz? First, I'd like to make the observation that as a classical musician and teacher, and in fact, all my formal training is in classical music as a performer and composer, I think Erickson and Coyle are right on the money. Perhaps the only exception I take is that for ensemble musicians who greatly unnumber soloists, of course, the learning that takes place in the context of rehearsing and performing, similar to what the Beatles did, is a key element of their success. As someone who's worked mostly as a soloist on the past two decades, I think it applies to soloists as well. Playing with other musicians, even if you're playing the soloist part, is not the same as what we do in the practice room. It's not that Erickson was wrong. I think this was simply outside the scope of the study. On the jazz side, let's look at Cole's ideas first. Number one, chunk it up. Sure enough, jazz musicians do extensive and very active listening to expert improvisers, often with their instrument in hand, copying what they're hearing note by note. And like any musician, they will break down larger pieces into smaller chunks to focus on problem solving. And of course, of course, slow, slow practice is essential. Number two, repeat it. It may sound surprising, but this is crucial for improvisation. Jazz musicians will practice the same musical patterns, bits of scales, chords, or broken chords, that is outlining a chord on a one note instrument like a trumpet or a saxophone. Or melodic fragments taken from recordings they like, and they will often learn to play these patterns in every key. It involves a huge amount of repetition to prepare for improvisation. Number three, learn to feel it. For jazz musicians, this amounts to learning to improvise without thinking, in particular in performance. The concept is in charge and the technique has become automatic. One needs to take the attitude of, hey, you've done the work in the practice room. Whether or not the work was all that good, it's too late, it is what it is. So now you just have to let it go. And this applies to novices as well as experts hoping to show their best current work on stage. Now, I want to show you a diagram that Coyle includes. As you can see, we've got deep practice leading to talent, and he also mentions ignition and master coaching. So ignition, we can think of that as the spark that generates the desire to succeed. And master coaching, which as you might expect, is the guidance of great teachers. And these are, listed, these are thought of as key ingredients along with deep practice to produce talent or expertise. How do these terms apply to improvisation? Ignition is tricky for any field because it's difficult to know what leads any kid to become quote unquote on fire about becoming a great jazz musician or to want to be great at anything really. They might grow up in a musical family watching their parents or older siblings perform, but this hardly guarantees that they will want to carry the torch, so to speak. I myself come from a highly unmusical family, yet so I surprised my parents by showing great interest in music from an early age. Why? 
Who knows? It does make you wonder about genes though. I was adopted and my biological father, who was a Middle Eastern man of both Arab and Persian descent, was involved in the arts. I didn't learn this though until I was well into my musical career. Whatever the case, it's true that some sort of inspiration is crucial. In my case, it started well after I acquired a trumpet, which I began to play at age 10 to help uh, with my asthma, frankly. My curiosity was piqued when I dug into my parents' old record cabinet, finding artists like Herb Albert and the Tijuana Brass, which most of you probably not have heard of as bands from the 60s and 70s, and great big band compilations. And then when I could buy my own records, I fell in love with the great sounds of the sounds of great trumpet soloists like Maurice Andre and Rafa Mendez and great jazz players like Miles Davis and Winter Marsalis. By age 13, I was hooked. Now the master coaching issue is complicated when it comes to jazz improvisation. While in classical music, most star performers have had very important teachers. And in other arts, there's a similar tradition of apprenticeship. In the days that jazz matured into the complex and vibrant art form that it is today, no real pedagogical parallels seem to exist for the top jazz musicians. For most of them, learning was often a haphazard process, copying songs or licks from recordings or even the radio, in some cases while not being able to read music and often with no private lessons. Stories abound about the confusion of young musicians when they first get on the bandstand. Even Charlie Parker, who many consider to be the greatest improviser in jazz history, as a 16 year old had no idea that song forms and chord progressions even existed. There's a dramatic story from this period of him being thrown off the bandstand by older musicians, hard to imagine. A lot of jazz musicians do apprentice in a sense with master musicians when they tour as side players in the bands. But some, ba some band leaders give virtually no feedback. When I toured with the legendary saxophonist Joe Henderson in my twenties, I was desperate for feedback, but all I ever got, and this was rare, was a quiet, yeah, Rex, from Joe. <laughs> if you liked one of my improvised solos, I'd be thrilled, but this hardly counts as detailed feedback. So in fact, for jazz musicians, the master coaching element seems to come as a cumulative sum of bits of feedback from a multitude of musicians over many years, including in jam sessions or in or informal practice sessions, or as a member of a band, or even occasionally in an actual private lesson. It seems to have been the duty of the musicians to manage this helter-skelter learning process over the long term and to channel it into their continued improvement over the years. As for Erickson's the principles of the del deliberate practice when it comes to jazz, let's revisit these principles. Develop skills that other people have already figured out how to do and for which effective training te techniques have been established. So right off the bat, there were some difficulties here. Yes, young jazz musicians are inspired to develop the skills possessed by their musical heroes, but it's not at all clear that effective training techniques have been universally established for how to do this. While jazz entered academia decades ago and there are successful teaching systems in place, most of the biggest icons in jazz essentially figured out how to play on their own in fits and starts with, as I mentioned earlier, little guidance. Furthermore, the end goal of almost every jazz musician is to do something other people have not figured out how to do, to establish an original voice on one's instrument and perhaps to be an innovator. It takes place outside one's comfort zone. In this case, I'd say jazz aligns perfectly. Musicians who are improving are deliberately pushing themselves to learn materials, whether repertoire or approaches to improvisation that are currently beyond their technical or musical command. Involves well-defined specific goals. Most of the time, this is true. A young musician might be trying to emulate a historical jazz figure in the medium term and to become a true original in the long term, but these goals are often not so well-defined or articulated and in the short term, they may be focused on minutia like learning a particular lick or how to navigate a tricky chord progression, forgetting about what the long-term goals are. One can sometimes get lost in the weeds, so to speak. Requires a person's full attention and conscious actions. This is spot on. While prof professional musicians might work on fundamentals while watching TV or Netflix, not that I recommend this, real work on improvisation requires undisturbed focus. When my wand, my, my wand, when excuse me, when my mind wanders when I practice an improvisation, my practice is useless. I either need to dial it in or just stop. It involves feedback and modification of efforts in response to that feedback. So this does not always apply in the, apply the way Erickson means, which is 
usually in an organized fashion, often and most use usefully provided by a master teacher. While jazz teachers are not uncommon today, as I mentioned, most jazz lenses do not receive this kind of directed feedback. They receive information they could interpret as feedback. Do my peers enjoy what I'm playing? Do audiences? What about the band leader? And as I mentioned, some band leaders were very spare with feedback. Getting fired or not may have been your only feedback from them. Most of the developing jazz musicians were reliant upon their own evaluations, trying to assess whether the work is moving in the right direction. And this can certainly lengthen the process of mastery. Producism depends on effective mental representations. This is absolutely the case. Jazz musicians build mental representations, not only of the ideal sound, but unlike many classical performers, representations of the structure of the music, chord progressions, scales, forms of songs. I often catch myself running a song over and over in my head, but it's not the melody. It's mental improvisation over the chord changes. This puts you, it's like my eyes glaze over. It can be a terrible thing until I, I break out of it. But I think every, every jazz musician tends to do this. Nearly always involves building or modifying previously acquired skills by focusing on particular, particular aspects of those skills and working to improve them specifically. Step-by-step -step improvement that leads to expert performance. This absolutely applies to jazz improvisation, yet not always in the most organized fashion. Breaking down different phrases one might have learned from a recording or learning how to navigate through less familiar keys. These practice goals can be broken down into very specific high resolution exercises in grueling practice sessions. Now that we've loosely compared mastery of jazz improvisation to the principles put forth by experts and researchers, perhaps we should examine jazz improvisation on its own terms. I'd like to start this by playing you a bit of music. This is one of the most famous improvised solos in history, and it opens what is almost certainly the most famous jazz album of all time. Miles Davis' solo on the tune, So What, from his album, Kind of Blue. And we'll hear the melody first.
it's hard to stop. You want to hear John Coltrane solo there too. But, um, so let's talk about what's happening in this recording. First, there is the opening pre-composed quirky melody as played by bassist Paul Chambers with rhythmic interjections by the piano and three horn players. Miles and saxophones legends, John Coltrane, as I mentioned, and Cannibal Adderley. As it turns out, everyone in the band is, very, is improvising to varying degrees, not just Miles Davis. So what's guiding them? For one, there's the organization of the pulse into four beat measures. All the musicians must agree on this or bad things happen. People could get completely lost on the form and then we'd have what musicians call a train wreck, which is probably self-explanatory. Then there is a framework of form. The musicians know that this song is a 32 measure is 32 measures long, and that it is comprised of an AABA form. That is an eight measure section that repeats, and then an eight measure section which contrasts with that first A section in some way, and then a final A section. This entire 32 bar, bar form repeats until all the soloists are finished improvising. Then there is the organization of the pitches. That is, how do they know what notes to play? In this case, the song is based on a single mode or scale at two transpositions based on D Dorian for the A sections and E flat Dorian for the B section. Now I realize many of you may not read music or have any theory background, so I wanna keep the music jargon to a minimum, but you get the idea that there's structure here that they're, they're applying to uh, create the parameters for their improvisation. So everyone within this framework, within these defining limits, everyone is improvising. The drummer, Jimmy Cobb, is maintaining the beat and the form, but varying what he plays within these parameters. Everyone else is negotiating the formal and rhythmic structures. But of course, unlike the drums, they're dealing with specific pitches. Essentially, the pianist, Bill Evans, the bassist, and horn players are creating the bass lines and musical phrases using the notes from the modes. Evans plays combinations of the seven notes of each mode throughout when he is comping, as they say, or crafting the background for the soloists. Now there is a caveat here. The mode is only a basis for pitch organization. The musicians are free to use notes outside of the mode, but ideally this will sound good because it is being done in an idiomatic fashion. The word idiomatic, which in its second definition from the Oxford, Dic the Oxford, no, Oxford Dictionary has a more obvious application appropriate to the style of art or music associated with a particular period, individual, or group. Fair enough, but it's the first definition that might yield greater insight in this case. Using, containing, or donate, denoting expressions that are natural to a native speaker. This definition brings us to one of the best ways to understand how jazz performance works and is learned through analogies with written and verbal language. I want to introduce you to another book far more specialized and less well known than those by Coyle, Erickson, and Gladwell. Thinking in Jazz, The Infinite Art of Improvisation by Paul Berliner, who is an ethnomusicologist and professor emeritus at Duke University. He previously, previously taught at Northwestern University where I was fortunate to take one of his classes. So this is a wonderful book, a true deep dive into the art of improvisation and jazz improvisation. But I have to caution you, unless you're a musician and read music very fluently with a rather extensive knowledge of theory and harmony, this might be a bit daunting. It's huge. The text is four, 504 pages long, not including the 243 pages of musical analysis, 56 pages of endnotes, and an extensive discography and bibliography arriving at a grand total of 883 pages. And truly, it seems to require this many pages to address the questions. What are these musicians doing? And how do they learn to master it? In the epilogue of this work, Berliner's remarks on the parallels of language give us some powerful insights into what Davis and Coe are doing and how they probably learned to do it. Berliner writes that, it is not surprising that improvisers use metaphors of language in discussing their art form. The same complex mix of elements and processes coexists for improvisers as for skilled language practitioners. The learning, the absorption, and utilization of linguistic conventions conspire in the mind of the writer or speaker, or in the case of jazz improvisation, the player, to create a living work. Just as creative handling of jazz vocabulary bears analogy to language use, the methods by which improvisers cultivate their abilities bear analogy to language acquisition. Like an intensive, immersive program for learning a foreign language, 
aspiring jazz performers peruse the music's multifaceted oral literature, acquired and analyzed a repertoire of compositions, classic solos, like the one we heard by Miles Davis, and discrete phrases, which embody the aesthetic values of jazz tradition and bring to light the underlying principles of improvisation. By contemplating this repertoire, students absorb the harmonic and melodic forms that guide the invention of and develop a storehouse of basic musical components from which they fashion their individual contributions to the group. The components include not only fully formed vocabulary patterns, but melodic and rhythmic cells, templates for rhythmic phrasing, fragments of theoretical materials and the like. Aspiring players can practice creating their own solos by training themselves to conceive ideas in jazz phrases and to express them through their instruments. They put into effect the conventional principles they have absorbed for interpreting and transfiguring musical models, imagining and performing versions that are inflected and rephrased, slightly ornamented, more substantially varied, or radically altered. They practice combining musical components into credible statements and developing their elements motivically to create musical episodes. On a larger scale, players eventually acquire the ability to tell stories, shaping ideas into a structure that conveys in the language of jazz, beginning, middle, and end. So that's a lot to process, but there are also simpler analogies to be drawn. Individual notes function like letters of the alphabet, combined not randomly, but to form recognizable idiomatic structures, like words. These structures are groups with more freedom, but using rules of form and harmony, like grammar and syntax, to create phrases like sentences, and so on until we're dealing with whole paragraphs or an entire story or a conversation. At each stage of larger structure, the chances increase that something entirely new will be improvised. And at every level, there are peculiarities of note choice and rhythmic feel that sound like jazz, that is distinct from other musical genres. Keep in mind that language can be used to explain errors too. A short phrase that doesn't sound good, at least to other jazz musicians, can be thought of as a spelling error. A larger phrase that doesn't make sense can be thought of as an error syntax. And of course, a collection of good phrases that might not hang together with the continuity to tell, it might not hang, it might not sound like a good story because it doesn't hang together with continuity. However, here's a bigger takeaway for me. I think the language metaphor, while most of us in the arts or some other fields such as mathematics have an awareness that it has utility, I think it's been vastly underused. I think it can be a great key to achieving mastery in a multitude of fields. Think about it, the use of language is one of the true, one of the few truly complex attributes shared by virtually every adult human being in the world across every conceivable culture. As such, we appear to be hardwired to operate within the structures of language. Indeed, it's so ubiquitous, so mundane even, that we take it for granted. But isn't it interesting to consider that we are all master improvisers in this domain? Every conversation is an effortless, effortless improvised work of art. Therefore, is it not the case that the language metaphor can be used to analyze and elucidate both for our practice and for that of our students virtually every art form as well as a multitude of other activities? And perhaps given our nearly universal ability to, to delineate and comprehend the world around us in terms of language, it could be a powerful key to attaining mastery. The examples we can explore are boundless, far beyond the fine and performing arts. Take the martial arts, for example. Having studied Shotokan karate, Tai Chi and a form of Kung Fu called Bagua Zhan, the parallels to verbal language and to jazz improvisation seem very clear. For example, a good deal of the training involves repetition of strikes or blocks to the point that they are so utterly absorbed and perfected that they can be deployed in the moment instantaneously without forethought to respond to an attack. Jazz, jazz musicians need the same dexterity when it comes to responding instantaneously to the improvisation of their fellow musicians over a set of chord changes. And does conversation not function in the same way? We have a vast repository of words, phrases, and concepts to draw upon. Yet in conversation, we do this without thinking as a respect and cogent response to the other speaker. We may pause to think, but we can't effectively speak and think at the same time. Even in the world of business, the language metaphor seems to me can have great power. I'm no expert in that field, but it seems to me that there is a language to business that goes beyond the technical understanding of production or the complexities of finance or the stock market. That knowledge could perhaps parallel a nuts and bolts level understanding of music theory, chord structure, et cetera, the alphabet, 
basic vocabulary and so on. An action taken by a particular business might show proper grammar, quote unquote, or not. That is, it might be intelligible in the context of commonly understood market dynamics, or it might be deemed confusing or nonsensical. An inspired decision might show a sense of poetry, perhaps leading to a breakthrough of the type described in another of Gladwell's famous books, The Tipping Point. While a risk averse decision might remain in the realm of the prosaic, sensible, but uninspired. I think that exploring every lesson that jazz improvisation may offer when it comes to our various arts disciplines may be an intractable task. And certainly it's beyond what I can be covered in a 40 some minute lecture. However, I'd like to point out one other remarkable quality of the jazz tradition, which ties in directly to its legacy of improvisational art and which can enlighten all of us about the process of innovation. It's a quality we might describe as hyper adaptability. While there certainly exist jazz, quote, snobs or purists, as there are surrounding every serious discipline, I'm not sure that any other art form can rival jazz for its openness to good ideas from outside its current tradition at any point. Jazz, provide, jazz improvisers have historically exhibited, seeming, excuse me, jazz improvisers have historically exhibited seemingly unlimited curiosity in other music traditions, visual art forms, even the songs of birds and wolves. As an example of this, Berliner writes, artists in New York City sometimes practice outside in deserted areas or near bridges where the performance is partially masked by late night traffic, adopting the city's collective sounds, the rhythmic clatter of cars and trains, the mix of honking horns and sirens as their accompaniment to improvisations. To quote Miles Davis himself in a humorous illustration of the willingness of jazz musicians to learn and appropriate from virtually any source, Rhythm is all around us, you know, he says, referring to legendary drummer, Anthony Williams. If Tony was walking down the street and stumbled, he might want to play that rhythm. This adaptability and openness have been keys to jazz's current continuing artistic vitality, as well as its seminal role in crafting new genres through fusion. In other words, as Berlino puts it, jazz remains a characteristically open music Capable, uh, capable of, of absorbing new traits without sacrificing its identity, which naturally enough leads to innovation within the form as well as beyond. It's a quality we should all ponder, I think, in terms of how it can be applied to the way we live our lives as well as how we practice and teach our art. I'd like to finish this presentation with another quote from Paul Berliner, taken from the last few paragraphs of Thinking in Jazz. In America, where European, African, and Native American ancestral voices mixed in the soundscape, African composers and their descendants created a unique family of musical traditions drawing from their heritage and the diverse elements of the international music culture around them. Jazz came forth from this family with its own affiliated conventions to develop through generations of creators, preserving and expanding upon contributions of the tradition's most significant composers and performers. For some, the commitment to jazz has a moral and ide ideological aspect. Improvisers embark on their personal odysseys with the conviction that they must share their talents with others, thus helping to maintain and ensure the survival of a unique, indispensable, indispensable musical tradition. In doing so, they hope to make their mark on a world plagued by social conflict and preoccupied with materialistic values. Improvisers view performance as a positive force that can redress this imbalance, if only in a small way, by replenishing the Earth's soundscape with music possessed of beauty and vitality, integrity and soul, to remind listeners of these finer universal expressions of human aspiration. Thank you.